Okay. Yes, only only executives uh, who want to who are who are taking Pilates right now are up at this time of day, and me. Yes, this this is this is why I'm alive right here. Hello, students. Nice. The world is this. What is not recommended? Listen. Oh, okay. Darn. Here's my first bit of advice. If any of you have issues with profanity, don't go into the film business. <laughs> don't. Just, just it is, it was Obviously founded and run by sailors. For those of you who don't know, sailors curse. That's an old... Rex and I both understand that we're both old enough to remember that sailors curse. So you're my blog. They can access it at DougRichardson.com. If you want to learn about... Well... I can't say there's a lot of learning that goes on with a blog. That's up to you if you want to learn. The blog is just simply a series of <clears throat> of adventures in the screenwriting trenches. Uh, and uh, were were you to to read it, it's it's about navigating Hollywood and and essentially learning by mostly my mistakes <laughs> uh, because learning to navigate Hollywood. And and there's there's having the talent to work in the business, and then there's um, then there's understanding how to navigate the business. You can have all the talent in the world. The most talented people in the world actually generally don't end up succeeding in showbiz. The most relentless people in the world succeed in showbiz. And uh, and 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 navigating Hollywood is like any business. It might be a little more difficult. So what my blog does it just I tell stories from all the way from back where you guys were in film school to um, last week, depending upon my mood. It's there every week and or most every week. And uh, by reading it, you'll learn a lot about how to get around, you know, the business again by either my mistakes or, 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 or learning or seeing because the most important thing when it comes to navigating Hollywood is to become a curiosity junkie. Uh, being a curiosity junkie allows you. Uh, the most successful people in this business are insanely and insatiably curious about how you got it done, how you cast that actor, how you got that shot, um, how you, you know, got that location, how you got the okay from that studio, 
And because the landscape is always shifting and the rules are always changing, you have to learn to be extraordinarily curious. And part of being curious is reading everything you can about how stuff gets done. And one of those things is my blog, amongst many others. Okay. And books and, you know, all the way back to William Goldman's Adventures in the Screen Trade. That book still applies. Very much so. The the most talented people I know, and if you ask, and most people I know in in showbiz, if you ask them, who's the most talented person you know, and they'll, and they know someone who's insanely off the charts, genius, brilliant, and they're not even in the business. They're working at a hardware wholesaler, and I'm talking about my most talented person I know. I mean, they're they're working somewhere else. The the people who are really talented and have some craft, they're nibbling around the edges of the business. Um, but they're still not in it. Um, it is a mixture of talent, craft, and incredible, relentless energy. And I don't mean relentless in a, in a um, backstabbing kind of Machiavellian way, but relentless in all efforts of in, in all your efforts, your efforts to get better at your craft, your efforts to get ahead at your craft, your efforts to find new ways to get it done. Um, everyone who is successful in almost every business, but especially showbiz, at least from what I've, what I've seen, has a drive to succeed. Um, and, and that's something you've got to find in yourself. You know, whatever that drive is, tap it, feed it, baby it, love it. Um, but that part needs to really come out because it's so competitive. Uh, if you don't have that, you, you know, you'll get beaten down and. Yeah. There has to be, you have to find some way to stand out. And if you're an Olympic athlete, you're going to stand out by winning, you know, at the end or being, you know, that incredible showcase athlete of some kind. Um, you, you know, you, you, it's, it's like there's, if you imagine all you guys sitting there right now, each one of you, that there's a thousand of you just like you. Um, trying to get ahead as an animator, as a writer, as a director, or 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 an actor. Um, how's anybody going to know to pick you out of all those other yous? You know what makes you stand out, and that's something you got to ask yourself all the time. And oftentimes, it's just being better at it than anybody else. And once you're better at it than everybody else, you got to figure out how to stay better at it than everybody else. It never ends. It's a very, you know, I, I remember once, I mean, there's a director that Rex and I are very familiar with, Barry uh, Le uh, Levinson, who's a great director. And, and I remember one, one time when he was at the, at the, I mean, he was at the top of his game. Whatever Barry wanted to do, he got made. All the movie stars wanted to work with him. He, his movies had taste. They were nominated for Oscars like Rain Man and stuff like that. And, uh, and I remember once I asked him, I said, wow, you know, it's great at your, I don't know if I asked him, it was more of like a, a comment I made that was completely incorrect. You know, you're, you're at the, the top of your game. It must be nice not to have to, you know, uh, grind anymore at it. And he said, oh, no, the grinding continues. The grinding never ends. And he went through a litany of things, you know, that he was still grinding about to kind of stay and maintain that position he was in. Um, and, uh, and, and all the other problems that came with, 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 with being there. And then at the same moment, 
when he was talking to me, here's the great Barry Levinson at that point. He wanted to know about how I got certain thing done in that movie. He was equally curious. You know, as I've said, these these curiosity junkies. He, he wanted to say, by the way, how when this scene, why did you decide to do it this way? Because it really worked. And I tried to do this at another time and I got shot down completely. How did you know? It's 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 everywhere and all the time. So be a curiosity again, be a relentless curiosity junkie from the outside while you're out there, while you know, read everything you can, ask Rex any question you can, ask me any question you can, and once you get inside the candy store, you'll you'll learn. You gotta stay equally curious. You have to you have you have to just love it and eat and breathe and love whatever, you know, you do. And that, I mean that's the good thing. The best job you'll ever have or that you'll never have is the one you love. It's just it's you know, and the good news is if you're in in this business, you're doing it cuz you really love it and, and 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 you have to really love it because the vicissitudes that come with it are it are are enormous, but the rewards, you know, are incredible. So, it's kind of worth it. In a lot, in a in, in a lot of ways, and and you're right in there. There is no coasting. You guys can look at that by actors or directors or wh whomever you admire. You'll see that picture or that show they did or that performance they did when they decided to coast, and the world comes crashing in on them. Yeah. My my breaking in journey is pretty vanilla, and uh, and it's you know it's but it's still good because it's it's my story and it worked. Um, my breaking in stories. I was a film student like you you all. I got out of film school, um, learning very quickly. Just because you go to film school doesn't mean you know anyone in Hollywood is going to give a, a rat's whatever about it. Um, all film school does is give you this gray, as George Lucas said when he came to talk at my film school, it gives you a great place. It's a great laboratory for you to learn and build skills. And and that's where it is. So I got out and I decided the best way to get into film, uh, the, the the I wanted to direct and the directors I admired, a lot of the directors I admired seemed to also have been writers. So I decided to write my way into being in, into showbiz. So I wrote and wrote. And uh, some spec scripts and lived really, really cheap in some very interesting circumstances, uh, as some of us do. And, uh, and then hustled an agent. And I mean hustle because that's what you got to do. How do you get – how did I get above all those other people trying to get, you know, and, you know my script read by that, that one agent? But I did. I hustled an agent. Here's another little just aside. You know, a lot of people think it's a – Anyone who says it's a who you know business, they're usually saying that as an excuse for their own failure. It's not a who, a who, who, like any business, once you're in the business, yes, it's a who you know business. And I'll say hardware again. And hardware's great if you know the other wholesalers and manufacturers. It is a who you know business once you get in because relationships are important. But the vast majority of people who work in the business didn't know a soul before they got in. <laughs> You know, like me. So until you get in, you don't know so. So I, I hustled an agent. When I got that agent, I, you know, wrote some more. I pitched a lot. I ended up getting a job, you know, and a check, which was amazing. Um, and then uh, after a few years of doing that and writing a few more scripts, I got noticed by the right, you know, producer who you know, had a great idea on, on, uh, on how to make Die Hard 2. In fact, Die Hard 2 had been in theaters 
for um, all of two weeks when uh, Larry Gordon called me in to sit down and talk with him. And uh, he was looking for a baby writer, unproduced, but at least had some chops, and he thought I was the guy to write Die Hard 2, but we were going to write it under the radar without the studio knowing we were writing Die Hard 2 because <clears throat> if it was officially Die Hard 2, then there would have been a lot of attention on it. And the, the studio wasn't ready to, to, to develop it yet, but he had a pretty good idea that they were going to want it down the road. And sure enough, once I finished it, you know, I was hired to write something called 58 Minutes, um, which we knew was going to be Die Hard 2 the minute. Almost the week I, I finished, the, the studio was saying, we really need Die Hard 2. And Larry, and Larry Gordon said, funny you should say that. I have this script. And, uh, and that's how I got my first film made. You know, and the rest is dubious history. No, it, it, it's oftentimes that spec script that you write that someone finally makes. And, you know, uh, I got mine. Mine was an assignment where I got hired to write a big sequel. So. And here I am talking to you guys. This is where it, this is where you end up. You want to end up here on the other side of a Skype conversation talking with Rex Sykes in his class. You know, this, this is how you want to go. Follow my route. It is. It was a path to a lot of things. It's, a, it's you know, I would say I'm very grateful. It's a path for that. You know, not, not the house I'm in right now, but the house I was in before. I called my Die Hard 2 house because it bought my house. And I like, I like the fact that they keep making them because I keep making more money. Any questions? The stupider, the better. <clears throat> I would say most of my stuff, most of my stuff and most of my better unproduced stuff uh, are a little bit more on the serious side. Um, I didn't, I hadn't before Die Hard, I had never even written an action film and which was the funny thing when, when they, they, I mean, I'd seen Die Hard and seen it actually twice in the first weekend when it opened, I was so knocked out by it. But when I got called in, I mean, I was just a movie fan at, at that point. But when I got called in, one of the things I told Larry was when they said, you know, would you want to, we're considering you for, for this, this movie. I said, you know what? I have never written an, a an action film. <laughs> and they said, don't worry about that. You know, we want it to be, you know, good and strong, well written and action will happen if it's right. And it's true. Action, the best action films are, are just suspense films that, that have, uh, that, that resolve in moments of action. Uh, but yeah, most of my stuff, a lot of my stuff, my earlier stuff, stuff that got me noticed was pretty much serious drama when they were making dramas on in movies. Not that they do do that so much anymore. So and uh, and and the novels I write right now, they're the L.A. Noir novels. They're primarily reality based. So not that I don't mind and mind the popcorn things. They've done very well for me. Right. John McClain. John McClain. John McCain. John McCain and John McClain. They're the same guy. They're both kind of bald now, and uh, and different kinds of action heroes. Well, 
well, stepping into the voice of the, it's like almost, you know, I didn't create the voice, therefore, and it may be because I was so inspired by the first one. I love the first one so much. You know, this hypersonic action movie. Um, it wasn't that hard because I was really inspired. Um, are, are you receiving me still? You guys are frozen. Oh, there you are. Okay. Suddenly it was a freeze frame. I thought it was the ending of an 80s TV show. Okay. So, so uh, I was so inspired. It, wasn't, it really wasn't that hard. Um, strangely enough, as I worked on versions of Die Hard 3 and Die Hard 4 down the road, I was more self-conscious about the voice and making it a Die Hard, <laughs> you know, or a worthy sequel um, than the second one, which was kind of curious. Uh, po possibly because it wasn't a cynical endeavor for me. I was trying really, really hard to make um, a good Die Hard. Because, uh, you know, oftentimes when you're the third and the fourth movie, you know, you're getting into serious sucking. So, so and it's a cynical endeavor for everybody except, you know, me. Uh, so the, it was not hard the first time because I was really inspired. So there weren't as many McLeanisms back then either. It was still still somewhat fresh. Suddenly, you know, except for writing a yippee Kaye mother, I'm not supposed to curse, um, then... You know, other than that, it was it was like just let it go. But after that, it was sort of like, well, we need certain McLeanisms, and Willis got into I need a McLeanism here. You know, let me find a line that someone wrote that uh, we didn't use in another movie, and so. Hi, Zach, off camera. Um, they're both very similar and very different, which is obviously <clears throat> a very bizarre or unsatisfying answer off the top. Um, one, it's, you have, you know, the wonderful thing about writing books is you have a direct connection with your audience. You know, you're writing it to be read, uh, uh by someone who's hopefully they're picking up your book or whether it's the blog they're reading the blog because they want to be entertained. You know, they want to enjoy that thing they're, they're going to do. So you're having a direct connection with your reader. When you're writing movies and television, your audience is not necessarily looking to sit down and enjoy your work. You know, if they do, that's kind of a wonderful byproduct, you know. Um, but they, they're oftentimes... Uh, reading way too much, reading a lot of bad material, uh, it's a chore for them. And when they finish reading it, or as they're reading it, they're not looking to read it and then move on to whatever they're going to read next. They're looking to quantify it, you know, your work into something that is going to uh, be a movie or a television show or that they can give to their boss, you know, quantify to their boss why their boss should read it and then want to send it to a, a manager or something. So your, your, your audience is very different and you do have to be aware of that to some degree that you're, you're writing for some very cranky, <laughs> cynical people. That's the, that's one of the big stark differences. The other really big stark difference is obviously the finite nature of a screenplay. And it, it certainly really needs to be a certain length. Uh, there's the format ish formats and movies are sight and sound. That's it. You know, your best screenplays are just going to contain sight and sound. Um, uh, the, you know, so your approach is you're having to live within that, that world and make choices within that world. Novels, obviously, you've read them. They're incredibly elastic. The, you, the, you know, what you can do with straight narrative um, is, very, is a massive wide spectrum. So your storytelling options are so much greater. Um, and, uh, and those are the big differences. The similarities are very simple. You have to get up, 
uh, sometimes at this time of day, not for me usually, but uh, you have to get up, you have to get and sit down in front of your your tablet or word processor or a computer or legal pad, however you write, and you've got to put something down on paper and have that discipline. And while you're writing it, you have to be compelling, which is no matter whether it's a screenplay or a novel, I'm trying to get someone to turn the page. Okay, my, I'm trying to tell a story in such a way that the reader has to turn the page. And that's the same whether it's a movie or a, screen, a screenplay or a book. If the, writer's, if, the, if the reader's not compelled to turn the page and move on, then I'm failing. And in that regard, they're exactly the same. You know, I have to be compelling. Exactly. Whether they want to invest an extraordinary sum of money into it, money into it, or an extraordinary sum of time into it, or to call in that one favor to that one manager who represents Tom Hanks to get that one read. I mean, all that stuff goes into reading a screenplay or a teleplay of some kind, or a a a, a, a TV pilot or something. All those things are are brought into it. Yet, if you don't get them to turn the page. It's moot. Well, let me tell you, that's one of the greatest things you can do at any dinner party with veterans and stuff like that, if you want to get a conversation going, is to talk about the weirdest and strangest place you ever got a screenplay. Because everyone's got those stories, and they're hysterical. Because um, everyone's, and they've got a few of them. Now, they're not nearly as good as the music executives. Because music ex executives have a thousand of them. Um... Uh, so the worst example is what you don't want to do. Here's an example what you don't want to do is you don't want to slip your screenplay under the door of a bathroom stall. It sounds like a cliche. It sounds like a joke, but it's not. People do this. Um, one of the great protocols and a simple protocol is make sure your script is is to get an agent or a manager. If you get good enough to get an agent or a manager, your screenplay is being submitted by someone who that executive or producer or whomever um, trusts to a certain point to filter. They're, they're saying, well, they're not going to, they're hopefully not giving me a piece of crap. Because they, they don't want to waste my time or I'm not going to return their phone call again. So they're going to give me something that they at least hope is something good. So at least as a producer, you got to look from their point of view, I'm reading something that is potentially going to be quantifiable into something. If I'm a producer at a cocktail party uh, or I can go through a myriad of places, people get screenplays. Um, and I get a screenplay from... Uh, a, a cocktail waiter or whomever and ask, you know, some stranger, the assumption is that this screenplay sucks. It's just real, the assumption, and I'm not talking, that's not funny. That's actual, that's actual, um, that's actually true based upon their experience because they've all read that screenplay from that cocktail waiter or that auto mechanic or whomever, because they still, it's weird, they still, at least for the first few times, think maybe this is the magic screenplay. Maybe this is the person that wrote this, wrote the next Star Wars or something, and they're going to read it, and they're going to, they're going to, you know, but after 10 of those, 
knowing they finding out they can't get past the first five pages, they realize it's going to suck. So you don't want to put yourself in a position where you give them a script that they instantly, based upon how they're receiving it, it's going to stink. Now, if you're Tom Hanks's nanny, and Tom Hanks then says, hey, do you have anything you've written? <laughs> I've heard you're a writer. I want to read your thing. They're soliciting you. Terrific. They want to read it. They're open. They're receptive. So you want to give it, you want to give your screenplay to someone somehow where they're in receive mode. Um, if you're a friend of, if, if there's, there's, they have different piles of what they have to read. The piles of, from a friend of a friend, you know, a neighbor or whomever, those ones that they have to read because they're going to bump into you someplace. Those are in the, I know it's going to suck pile, but I might have to read it. You're still in the, I know it's going to suck pile. So, the really the best way is once you is to get yourself established, get an agent and get or a manager. And if you're good enough, you'll get an agent or, or a manager once you figure that out. Then it's it's you know you're it's being sent to someone who's in receive mode. You want incoming mode, not it's going to suck mode. Right. And, and, and here, it's, for some reason, people think screenplays are easy to write. They do. Maybe because you can get a program and it formats it for you, or everyone has a movie in their mind. But you're talking, the Writers Guild registers 50, 60, 70,000 screenplays a year. Okay. And I swear, all of them are working, all those screenplays are written in Starbucks or by, you know, the baristas working at Starbucks. I don't know, but there's every the joke here is that everyone's got a script, and that's because it seems like everyone's got a script. And you gotta get through that noise. So, um, and that's the other thing. The, the idea is that well, my script is gonna be that one that stands out. You wanna find a way to get your script to stand out because there's so much bad stuff out there floating around because anyone thinks they can write them. And they do end up in that pile that Maybe, you know, or under a bed or under a, you know, and I'm talking, I know someone who literally got a screenplay when she was in her wedding gown, seconds before she was going to walk down the aisle, the rabbi walks back into the, into the, the little waiting room where she is, you know, she was a, an, an, an ex executive at DreamWorks, she walks back in the, the room where she, where she was waiting to walk up the aisle and the rabbi, she thinks he's about to give her some final last words of wisdom before she walks up the aisle and takes the vows. And he hands her a script, you know, to read on her honeymoon. And I, it's just, and that's, that's true. You know, that ended up under a day bed in her house. Only when they decided to move to their next house, did she discover, rediscover it. She eventually read it. She felt so bad that she hadn't read it. And it was horrible. And, um, and oh, here's the other thing about writing. Having to read that horrible script from that person who you agreed to, to, to read it from. You have to call them back. Right. And are you going to lie, which most people do, <laughs> or are you going to tell them, it was really bad and I couldn't get past the first five, five pages. Please don't quit your day job. So.
Oh man, that's the that's the hardest question. And it's the most argued question in the screenwriting teaching world or the screenwriting guru world. You know, you've got all these these wonderful I'm not saying wonderful, I'm saying that very facetiously. These books out there written by a lot of people who know who claim to know how to write screenplays and they they're willing to sell you that idea that's going to help you you know it's just like infomercials you know <laughs> it's that that one they're selling hope that one little thing that if you learn to do that then this will make you a great screenwriter and and then you go to the back page of the book or you and you read the most successful thing this particular author a writer about screenplays has ever written is this book that he just wrote about how to write screenplays. Usually they haven't, maybe they had something optioned. Usually they barely haven't done that. Most people who've, who have succeeded in the business as, as writers don't have time to write these books or don't want to be guru, gurus. Um, that said, everyone's got a different opinion and I obviously have mine. Uh, um, there's so many books about structure out there because structure is so important. I'm not gonna, structure is crazy important to telling a story. Unfortunately, they all they're all trying to sell their version of structure. There's a book out there and a few sequels of it called Save the Cat. Has anyone heard of it? Rex has. Yeah, yeah. Well, if you start writing screenplays, that'll be one of them. Save the Cat is the new series of books that. I mean, break down exactly what your screenplay needs. The problem with Save the Cat is everyone else has read it, okay, <laughs> including a lot of producers and executives. So they're all trying to make the same movie or write the same screenplay or version of it, and that's a lot of what you see on screen right now. It's succeeding to a certain degree because a lot of people want to see that kind of thing, at least in the commercial, you know, the big commercial blockbuster movies. Um, and that's going to run out of gas really quick. You know, everyone's on the same bandwagon and they're going to go that away, go away. So the best thing I can say on top after I ripped on all this other crap <laughs> is become unavoidable. Write that thing that I have to read, okay? That when you give it to me, I can't help read it. And it comes back to being compelling. Structure takes care of itself in your storytelling. You can create any structure whatsoever, whether it's one act, three acts, seven acts. I mean, most theater pieces are two acts, you know? Or someone can break them down and say, well, they're really three acts. Well, look at Quentin Tarantino films. Okay, who doesn't love them? They're they're not acts. They're all in chapters. He threw out structure a long a long time ago. His whole thing is, I'm going to be super compelling. I'm going to create questions with the characters, um, with the story, a sense of what's going to happen, or suspense, and then I'm going to resolve it in some regard. That is satisfying. That's structure. That's pure and simple. If you live by that and write by that, and I sometimes have taken little post-its and put it up above my com computer screen to say, why are they turning the page? Why are they reading this? You got to put yourself in the position of the reader yourself and write something that you and someone else really, really wants to read. Okay. And that the rest will take care of itself. If you live by that credo, no matter what you write, if you live to live to that and live up to that bar and clear that bar, it's going to be really interesting to read. And, and if you marry that with this thing that's in you, this story that you really want to tell, whether it's a story about something in outer space, you know, and a big giant popcorn thing, or if it's two, peop two soldiers sitting in a foxhole trying to get along. If you make it compelling and make it interesting, you know, as in 
create questions that I have to answer by turning the page, then you're succeeding. And that's always going to work. And that's how the new interesting movies are going to come if writers just stick to that. That's how a movie like, I mean, pulling something out of the air. How does someone make up memento? I mean, there's no three-act structure to that. That's just an idea that someone figured out saying, that's really cool. Now, how do I make it really interesting for 100 and some odd pages? And then turn that into a movie. That's all it is. It's that simple. And keep it simple. I heard, I heard my name is Thunder, but I don't think that's what he said. Is, is your name really Thunder? Oh, do you have a sister named Lightning? Okay. Uh, the challenges are, I mean, we talked about it earlier a little bit, the voice, you know, and I think it can become such an overwhelming challenge. You should just throw it out and stop worrying about being that voice because you got to make it, hopefully they've hired you because you are that voice or they want you to, 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 to be that voice and, uh, and to write something that's, that's, that's good. That's not, um, you know, when I was writing Die Hard 2 and I've talked to other people who, 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 who've written sequels where you get in trouble is where you're trying so hard to be that movie or be the next version of that movie that you saw instead of, Man, I'm just trying to approach this the same way I would anything. I'm trying to write a good story, you know, and I'm trying to do it well. And if it's within the parameters, the outline that you put together, that would be that sequel. I think that's the most important thing, and that's the hardest obstacle to, 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 to overcome. I think so many people, when you're writing a sequel, get so wrapped up in, man, I'm writing the sequel. I have to be – it's almost like trying to be someone else that you're not. Um, no, be yourself and tell it through your filter. That would be the best way. That's what's going to come off and be interesting. And, 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 uh, and that's a way to get around the obstacle, but that's the biggest obstacle uh, amongst the obvious ones, which are these ridiculous people, producers and studio executives who aren't thinking that they're just thinking, they're thinking that your movie is going to make God knows how much money and how much money, how much more money they can make out of it by doing X, Y, and Z and, and, and to fit it in their, their, their idea. I will give you one little silly story um, about an obstacle in writing a sequel. I was, uh, had this meeting on, I don't go through the whole long story of writing Die Hard 4 or my version of Die Hard 4, but um so I'm in this big giant conference room at Fox, uh, and in the conference room with me is Tom Rothman, the CEO of the studio, Jim Giannopoulos, the head of marketing, which is always a scary idea when you have the head of marketing in your in your in your story meeting, um, and a bunch of executives, uh, uh, Bruce Willis's manager and uh, and partner Arnold Rifkin, and the big bald guy himself. You know, you know. It's, so Bruce is there too. And uh, we're, we're Bruce, Bruce and I spent eight months working on the script to get it the way we wanted it. And now the, the head of the studio is giving us notes. And uh, he suddenly stands up and describes this cornfield. I see this beautiful cornfield, beautiful, green, wave, Americana, waving corn, just in the wind. It's beautiful. It's this image of just... You know, of, of just America. And now I want the cornfield to blow up. And he looks at me like this and says, that's a scene I can sell. That's something I can put in a trailer. Now, mind you, there were no cornfields or any agricultural areas in anything that had been conceived at that point. <laughs> 
where are, um, you know, where is this cornfield? Why in the world does it blow up? You know, who's blowing it up? And to what purpose does it serve blowing up the cornfield? All these questions are coming up in my mind, except Bruce jumps up and goes, awesome, that's great. You know, um, because he just wanted to say that at that moment, or whether he didn't believe it. What he didn't know is that he was, as the big 800-pound gorilla, rubber stamping this ridiculous, horrible idea of this five-second image this executive knew he could put into a trailer and, you know, a movie trailer and sell it, you know? Well, suddenly that is an obstacle that became my problem the minute the meeting ended, along with a few other things that the big bald guy had said awesome, cool to, which were ridiculous and stupid. So those are some of the obstacles that would come up in writing a sequel. Um, but those are the obstacles that come up in every movie in the rewrite process as you head towards production, you're going to have the crazy harebrained, insane, ridiculous ideas that you either have to turn into gold somehow or find a way to get them to figure out that it was a really bad idea without actually telling them that's a bad idea because they're writing the checks and they're all think they're smarter than you. So, They, that is it. They, you know. Right. I mean, as I walked out of that meeting, you know, Willis turned to me and said, you can ignore everything Tom said in there. You know, we're still going to make our movie. And I said, are you out of your mind? You just said, you know, we're not talking about some junior executive. You just, just said yes to about eight really harebrained ideas to the CEO of 20th Century Fox. He's the guy who's going to write you that $20 million check. All right. He's, you don't say no to him. And now you just made them all my problem. So, I mean, it's, you know, money talks. It is a business. And there's a certain point where you got to. You know, so I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to blow up that cornfield. And guess what? I did. And it sucked. It was, I tried, worked, I tried, I did my best. Was it in the movie? No. You guys saw Live Free or Die Hard? No, it wasn't in the movie. Have you seen a cornfield blow up in any movie since? No. No, but it came out of his mouth at that moment. And because he was, you know, the guy writing the check, I had a chance to say, Tom, I don't think that's a good idea. But I already said that earlier when he said he wanted to make the PG-13 version of Die Hard. And I, I'd already had that argument with him. You know, saying, you know, because we were only allowed one F word and we were going to have to have the F word on yippee ki mother blah. So, um, <laughs> I, and, and I, as I argued with him that, that it might not have been the best idea to have had a, a, a PG-13 rated diehard considering they were all R before that, uh, his answer to me was, are you going to tell me I can't advertise on The Simpsons? There we go. Because I have children. You learn how to self-censor. And what's funny with children is they get older and they start to not self-censor. That's really funny because you're still self-censoring and they're like dropping a bomb every so often. And you don't want to tell them because they're sort of like almost grown-ups, you know, at a certain point. Well, that may not be a good idea to say that here in this in this moment, but, you know. And I have no credibility whatsoever as much as I censor myself in front of my kids. Once they've seen one of my movies, I'm screwed. So. Uh, well, as in working with other writers as if you're writing with them?
Well, yeah, but that's but that's uh, there's difference. There's writers who work in teams, and that would be a circumstance under which you have a writing partner or partners. There's very few writing teams of more than two, so figure that out. Um, but um, and then when you see a movie with a lot of credits with other writers on them, <coughs> excuse me, that means um, over the course of the development of the movie. Uh, there were a lot of writers on who wrote different versions of the script. And then they had to go through this unfortunate process called arbitration. And in the process of arbitration with the Writers Guild, um, uh, three writers sit down with all the materials <clears throat> that have been submitted by the studio, and they f try and figure out who deserves credit. And uh, generally speaking, there's a few writers who may not have gotten and written enough to have received credit on the movie that whose names you didn't even see. So that's, so you're not necessarily working with those other writers in some regards. Um, you're competing with them for credit in the end at some point, but, uh, you're usually, you know, sometimes you're the writer before, sometimes you're the writer after I've been, in, been the first guy, I've been the last guy and I've been all the people in between. And, uh, so you're not really working with them. I only wrote one thing, with one other person at one time, and that's a long story, and it was a disaster. So, I only have one marriage, and that's the one I'm working on. It was a disaster because we, it was the first screenplay that sold for a million dollars, so we received a lot of attention, and uh, the relationship didn't quite survive what came after it's a long story so which i don't like to tell because i might cry it was a story it's just a, a story of a friendship gone south you know don't loan, don't loan money to friends don't write movies with your friends at least write successful movies hello steve Well, the Die Hard 4 you saw was not the one I wrote. Um, speaking of that same guy who wanted to blow up the cornfield, Tom Rothman. Um, Tom hadn't worked on the other Die Hards, but he ran the studio. He was in charge. He wanted to make Day After Tomorrow with John McClane. Quote, unquote, that's him. I want to make D Day After Tomorrow with John McClane. That was the whole concept of the movie because he, didn't, he knew how to sell Day After Tomorrow. He'd done it very successfully. He had, hadn't sold a Die Hard before, so he wasn't sure what to do with that. So that's one of the reasons why Die Hard 4 was so different than, you know, the other Die Hards. Because, you know, the, they, the, the other Die Hards in, involved, as much as they were big, they involved theft and stealing and, and uh, you know, like a big, a big crime taking place where... And Die Hard 4 ended up having a crime involved at one point when it finally got made after there were 13 writers totally on that over the course of its development or something. Uh, they finally went with Mark Bombach's script, which was, you know, deservedly speaking, he got credit on it, even though a whole lot, a lot of other people came and wrote it. So um, the differences between them is, you know, Die Hard 2, you're just trying to make another, you know, same... How can the same thing happen to the same guy twice? That's Die Hard 2, essentially. You know, John McClane is the fly in the ointment again. So you're giving up that conceit again. And then how do you expand it out? Die Hard 3 was, you know, okay, Hans Gruber had a, you know, had a brother or a cousin. And it was kind of a revenge plot and, you know, a, a heist story. And then by the time you got to live for your die hard, then it's, it's, you know, day after tomorrow. It's, you know, the world is, someone's trying to shut down the, the, all the electronics and, and, uh, and software and, and computer systems in the U S major disaster. And John McClane saves America from that disaster. So that's, that's the evolution where you get there. I, I don't necessarily think it's a good idea. That's not the movie I, I wrote which is why I don't have any 
credit on it. There are two scenes in the movie that I wrote that they kept. They said, oh, those are good scenes. We're going to keep those. But uh, other than that, you know, it's, 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 you know, there's a lot of, when, when you're making decisions cynically and they're, and they're about making money at that point, when you're making a three or four or five, it's all about, you know, making money. A lot of those decisions are all about just that only making money and not necessarily decisions that make it a good movie. And now actually the way those movies are made, the decisions are not even made to make it, whether it's a good movie or not, the decisions are made is do they fit into our marketing paradigm? Because at that point it's all about how to market that movie and make sure they make their money. So screw the writer. Right. You're not necessarily doing it. I mean, the, 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 my personal example is the, re, the way I got involved in Die Hard 4 was I didn't want to write Die Hard 4. Literally. That's how I got involved. Bruce Willis dropped a script in my lap and said it was Die Hard 4. And he said, I'd like you to read this and tell me what you think. And I read it over lunch because we're in the middle of making a movie. I went to his trailer. I didn't like the script, but I said, listen, I don't want to see Die Hard 4. You know, I don't want to see Die Hard 4. So I may be the reason why I don't like the script is because I don't want to see Die Hard 4. I think I've seen it. I don't want to go there again. And then uh, he asked the question of me, which was, well, what is a Die Hard 4 you'd want to see? And thus began the discussion. Uh where I then made up the Die Hard 4 I wanted to see, that was a very writerly decision, a, a, a movie fan decision. I want to I want to see this movie. So I came to it from a, a the, the least cynical place whatsoever of a Die Hard 4 I wanted to see. This is something that stirred Bruce, that then took us to Fox, got them very angry at me because they had a Die Hard they wanted to make, you know, which was that Mark Bombach script. And then I went and I wrote a movie that I wanted to see. And Bruce got behind it and it was very, it was great. But unfortunately, everyone else wasn't seeing, wasn't trying to make a Die Hard they wanted to see. A Die Hard that was worth it, you know, a movie that was, that had value with a four on it. I mean, imagine doing that. Um, for everyone else, it was a completely cynical endeavor. And as much as I'd been in the business and as long as I'd been in the, in the business and as sage as I should have been, I was still kind of shocked and hurt that I realized that I was the only one in the room at the end of the day who was just trying to make a good movie. So, lesson learned. Maybe. <laughs> I may make that mistake again because I'm a cup half full kind of writer. And you got to be that. Ooh, spawns of Satan. Yes. Well, that's not really getting stolen from me. That's actually, they paid me a very healthy sum of money to work on Dyer for. Um, and my version of it, they owned, they owned everything I wrote, every the and 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 kaboom and whatever I wrote, you know, they own. So they have the, the legal and moral right to just say, you know, we're going to keep a little bit of this and keep a little bit of that. And like I told you earlier, you know, that was a movie where, where, where Bruce was actually in his trailer on the set some days, scouring through scripts of mine and others looking for McLeanisms, all stuff that had been written before. So that's not really getting ri ripped off. You realize there's not enough, you know, to kind of arbitrate for credit because there's two scenes in the movie that belong to me, just two scenes. So, you know, you just sort of smile and 
appreciate it. You know, some writers get pissed that, you know, that's different than what I wrote about with getting ripped off where you go into a room, you go into a meeting with, with a producer and they have an I you talk ideas and they're because as a screenwriter, you need to be very facile with story on your feet and in the room. Maybe some stuff comes out of your mouth that's really amazing. And sometimes you can make up a whole movie in a matter of minutes. And then unfortunately you find out four months later that they pretty much took everything that you said in the room and sold it to another studio with another writer attached. That's just an example of getting ripped off. Um, and there are smaller versions where I've got, you know, scenes or sequences of stuff that I've written in scripts that have ended up in other, uh, other films to I've had an entire, entire stories that were actually registered by the guild that were stolen and ripped off, you know, where I actually was able to come back and, you know, litigate to, to a certain point and earn money. The, the point of the piece was, the blog piece was, it's not necessarily where uh, you're being, you know, imitations is, is the sincerest form of flattery. It's more that you're in a business that is populated by a lot of intense, we talked about earlier, relentless people, some of whom are moral and many of whom are not. And those people who are not, sometimes you don't know that they are not, and they're going to they're gonna take things from you because they don't have ideas of their own. And that's how they've sort of gotten ahead at that point. And writers are the easiest ones to steal from. And I'm just trying to say the good news about the idea is if you're is, – is that everyone's been stolen from. Everyone, every writer worth his salt uh, in, in, in Hollywood – can sit down and tell you stories about, oh yeah, I was in a room, I was at lunch with this producer, and then he sold it the, the, an hour later at Fox, you know, when I had lunch and I kind of spun a little bit of gold for him. And it just, it's, it's part of the business, it's a horrible part of the business, but it exists, and uh, you, you've got to sort of put on your steel jock strap every time you go to work, because you're going to get kicked in the balls. Does that answer your question? Okay. That's probably more than you needed. Sorry. I need more coffee. Fifteen golden minutes. We better make it count. This is the speed round, people. Hey, Jake. Wow. Hardest time. I, it's almost like, wow. I'm trying to think. What was the hardest time I ever had getting a movie made? Um, I can't think of one of them being harder than another. They're all hard. They're all really, really hard. Um, the ones that stand out are the ones that actually got so close, so close and so close and didn't get made. Those are even harder because you're just, you know, you. I, I had one movie I – I was on, seriously, we were in prep for a year. Locations, casting, locations, casting, locations, casting. So, um, God, what's the hardest movie? Um, I guess, because sometimes the, most, the, the hardest movies also can be the most satisfying. For example, ba Bad Boys. That Bad Boys was a really hard movie in that it was, there was really no script. We had two actors with, who had, both had sitcoms at the time, so they had this thing called a hiatus, which was a nine-week period where they weren't working, that we had to get it in, and the studio sort of said, here's a little bit of money, you guys go to Miami, and, you know, they sort of trusted and didn't trust us. We had um, two veteran producers, one of which was brilliant, one of which was half in the bag. We had a director who'd never directed a movie before, who had no clue about screenplay and stories. And um, 
uh, one of our, you know, one actor who had an entourage as big as Eddie Murphy's and had demands. And it just, it, everything about that movie before we started shooting was, it was a disaster. You know, we had, and, and there was no script. There was an out, there was a script that had been made, uh, that had been developed over 11 years called Bulletproof Hearts by George Gallo that had gone through all these different incarnations. And those of you who've seen bad boys or know about bad boys, if you're dudes, you probably have, <laughs> but, um, the, Eight months prior to production, um, with the same director, Michael Bay, it was a movie scheduled to be made with John Lovitz and, oh, why is his name? I'm missing it. It's not, oh, forget it. Anyway, it wasn't David Spade, but it's a guy I confused with David Spade, but just a really bad piece of casting that would have changed the movie. So they kept a little tiny bit of the script and we went to Miami and for a few weeks we were writing it on Monday and shooting it on Wednesday. And like I said, everything could have gone as a disaster, but it was worthwhile, not only just because it did well, because once everyone got there and got and saw the spot we were in, you suddenly had a lot of people bringing their best out and everyone putting their oars in the water, going in the same direction direction. So as hard as that was, it turned out and it ended up being enormously satisfying. And those tend to be the most, and I, the most satisfying, I think the ones, you know, the, the, the wars that were hard fought and won. And you had something you had, you were going to ask Rex on top of that? Bad boys, bad boys. Hello, Zach, number two. My favorite screenwriter? I can't say it. Well, first of all, here's something that's kind of... I mean, I, there's some, I would say the favorite, my favorite screenplay I ever read, and I'm saying this because it's the favorite screenplay I've ever read, but screenwriters don't read a lot of screenplays that other screenwriters have written. We're busy writing our own stuff. Um, and, and some people will tell you, read a lot of really good scripts and that will help you. And if that inspires you to write, then great. Sometimes people get so wrapped up in what other people have written that they're not focusing on what they want to write. So... And I, it's funny, I get asked this question a lot, what's the best screenplay I've ever, I've ever read? And I, I've not read a lot of really great screenplays because I have not read a lot of, I've not read a lot of screenplays of movies. That, I've seen a lot of great movies based on great screenplays, but I haven't read the screenplays which they were done. I would say, so that said, I did read um, uh, the original draft of, and it's early in the morning, I don't know why the name is escaping me, Who's the playwright who wrote the original draft of Empire of the Sun? Um, so someone Google it real quick. Um, uh, he's an, he's an, an, an English playwright. Uh, that script was just like reading the best Dave, David Lean movie. It was just absolutely rapturous. <laughs> I cried in the end. And screenplays don't make me cry. So that's my favorite screenplay. Writers... I, they change over time. My favorite writers right now are TV writers, TV showrunners. Uh, David Simon, he's my favorite writer right now. Um, just an amazing, the, the voice that comes out of him. I just watched his, uh, his very unsatisfying, in the end, <laughs> um, HBO uh, miniseries, um, Show Me a Hero. And, uh, uh, I mean... And Paul Haggis directed it. But if you've seen The Wire and you know that voice and his ability to write these characters in such a way where you just fall in love and feel for every one of them without him, you know, putting in little bits and pieces of business to make you feel for them just by their behavior. Um, you know, he's right now, he's, he's 
I'll read anything that, or I'll watch anything he's written because I think his stuff is that good. So, did anyone Google Empire of the Sun? I feel terrible. I don't. Yeah, yeah, this is real simple. Land, the landscape is always changing. I said that. The, the filmmaking landscape is changing. Right now, the movie business is kind of a really crappy business. They're just only into, into making what they can market, at least on the inside, the studios. You see the movies they can make. They're, they're making sequels, movies based on, on, on intellectual properties that are popular, that they know that they that they can sell, you know, whatever. And, and it's all franchisable. There's no such thing as the one-off. Now we're heading into the fall where you start seeing the movies that people think about as Oscar worthy or the more artistic kind of movies. And, um, I, I, I can do that too. <laughs> um, but I'm can't see your class when you do that. Um, anyway, uh, those movies are mostly made independently. Hollywood's not made making those movies, those movies are made outside the system and then distributed within Hollywood. Uh, that being said, you can make movies anywhere right now. That's the great thing. You can stay there and make movies, you know, for no money. Uh, you can make movies on your iPhones. You can edit on your MacBooks. I mean, you know, as long as you make something that's interesting that someone wants to see and the platforms are expanding left and right, you're going to be able to just release your own movie, you know, and then through social media, advertise it on a little platform and get noticed. And maybe that'll get picked up by a distributor and end up in a theater somewhere. Um, the pendulum is swinging back away from these prefabricated, pre-marketed movies back to more filmmaker driven stuff. So the, the stuff is you're going to, you're going to, we're going to find filmmakers right out of your class right there that don't have to be in Hollywood that would have made the movie in Hollywood. And that's the great thing. Everyone ends up here because most of the talent's here and a lot of the money's here and the, and the movie stars are here and the great actors are here. So, um, but just make, write your screenplays, you know, make your movies your way, you know, screw everyone else as long as you make them interesting uh, and then see where it goes. That is my advice. Don't be too anxious to get inside the candy store right now because the candy is pretty crappy. Tom Stoppard, yes, thank you. If you ever get a copy of that original screenplay, you'll see the movie that Steven Spielberg didn't know how to make. He got afraid. He, afraid. he was afraid of it. So he was afraid of certain moments and certain sequences in, in, the, in, 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 in the movie. But boy, what a great screenplay. Thank you. It's terrible having to get up early. It's just... You know, I'm kidding, but having to get up early and function is, you know, and speak is different. Anytime, Rex. Oh, Nat's early bite. We're going to go to Nat's.
and read and read my and read my really good novels. If you like, if you like, you know, crime fiction, L.A. Noir, they're really good, and you know, that's uh, you know, you'll have fun. I promise you. Or I'll write you another book, you personally. No, you haven't, but it's nice to finally hear it. All right, there we go. We're t touching. All right. All right. Take care, gang. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.